Hello everyone, this is Diana Williams and this is our March author live stream uh, for the Bookstory Club. Uh, if you're new to the club or if you haven't been with us during our live streams before, um, you'll know that this live stream uh, gives you additional insight and opportunity to connect directly with the author of the book that we've chosen for the month. Um, and so I'm very excited to have uh, today's guest. Um, our guest today is Elliot Gorn. He is the Joseph Galliano Professor of American Urban History at Loyola University of Chicago. His books and articles embrace multiple aspects of urban and American culture, particularly the history of various social groups in American cities since 1800. His latest book, and the one we're discussing this evening, is Let the People See, the Story of Emmett Till, which was published by Oxford Uni University Press this past October. So please welcome Elliot Gorn to Book Story. Hi, Elliot. Hey, Diana, how are you? I'm good. Um, I, like I said, I'm really excited to have you here today. And one of the reasons why we selected your book um, for, and I said March, and I actually meant February. It's not quite March yet. Um, but uh, the reason why um, I was excited to select your book and, and the reason why our staff chose it is because um, we feel like the story of Emmett Till has been told a lot, especially in the last few years. Um, but we were really interested in your telling of it. Um, but before we get into um, just your approach to telling this particular story, I was wondering if you could give our audience just a quick interview for those who don't know, you know, who was Emmett Till and what's his significance in American history? Uh, sure, it, and it actually always surprises me that there are a number of people who don't know the story um, because it seems so with us, especially today. Um, mm -hmm. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old um, uh, boy. Uh, actually, it's always the story is always told that he's from Chicago, but actually, he was most of his life in a little town out in Cook County, but outside of Chicago, a town called Argo. Um, that's significant because Argo was not rigidly segregated. Uh, it was uh, there was no there was no uh, racial uh, paradise, but it was it was the school was integrated, sports teams local sports teams tended to be integrated. And that gives some sense of what Emmett Till might have expected or what he had lived with before he goes to Mississippi. Um, it, it, uh, he, he leaves, his family does finally move to Chicago for the last couple of years of his life. He's just turned 14 years old. Uh, his mother brings him to the station, puts him on the train where he, on the train, the Illinois Central train, he's greeted by his great uncle, Moses Wright, who lives in the tiny town of Money, Mississippi. And, and, and down they go to Money, where Emmett will spend two weeks, summer vacation, with his cousins. Uh, he's been before uh, a couple times, uh, and they've come up to Chicago, which is part of the Great Migration, the, the backing and forcing of people, visiting, family. Um, and, and he's down in, in Mississippi, and with his cousins and, and friends, they get in a car one evening after he's been there a few days, and they go into town, this crossroads town of Money, uh, Hernan de Soto Money was the, the man for whom it was named. And it's on, it's, it's, the story is told so many ways as to what happens next. Um, we know that Emmett Till went into this tiny crossroads store, uh, Bryant's grocery store, that there's a lone woman working there, a young woman, 21 years old, Carolyn Bryant. Emmett is in there by himself um, in, as, as all kinds of accusations are made as to what he did after uh, that event, uh, that he laid hands on her. She says that he grabbed her, that he swore at her, said, said obscene things, propositioned her. Emmett's cousins who were with him detected nothing out of the ordinary when they saw him. But then he goes out of the store. Uh, Carolyn Bryant, a few minutes later, comes out of the store. And according to Emmett Till's cousins, uh, Leela Parker and Simeon Wright, Emmett Till wolf whistles at her. They're very clear about that uh, mm -hmm. uh, through their, throughout their lives. Um, and then uh, uh, that, that scares everyone to death because those, those kids who were raised in the South understood uh, what kind of jeopardy this put them all in. They, they fly into the car and fly down the road uh, back to Mose Wright's home. 
a few days pass by and nothing happens. And they, they think that, uh, well, probably there'll be no repercussions. Uh, on a Saturday night, really a Sunday morning, 2 a.m., Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, and his uh, half-brother, J.W. Milam, go to Mose Wright's home, uh, knock on the door, and when he answers, gun in hand, gun and flashlight in hand, they kidnap him until, take him away. Uh, he's never seen again alive by his family. A few days later, his body is found in the Tallahatchie River, weighted down with a barbed wire around his neck attached to a, an enormous gin fan like an industrial fan, to weigh him down. Um, and uh, uh, from there, the story starts to develop. Uh, this would have been, as so many people have said, uh, maybe not too many years before, maybe if Emmett Till was a little older, maybe if he wasn't from Chicago, this story would have just passed, another, another murder, another lynching that no one, that would never get out of Mississippi. A few things happen. Um, Mamie Till, her name back then was Bradley, Mamie Till Bradley prevails upon her congressman, we later learned, William Dawson, Chicago, African-American Chicago congressman, to help her get Emmett Till's body out of Mississippi. The authorities in Tallahatchie County were ready to uh, just simply bury it right away. Um, mm -hmm. And Emmett Till comes back to Chicago on the train. Famously, she identifies her son and she uh, uh, asks that there be an open coffin, that the, that the undertaker not critify him, that he be, that the coffin be open. She even allows a photographer to come and photograph him. Mm -hmm. Those photographs are, of course, so iconic now. They appeared in Jet Magazine, the Chicago Defender. There's a, there's a misconception that they appeared in the mainstream press too, Life Magazine, for example. They didn't. They, mm -hmm. they, were, they were mainly not seen by white people for 30 years. Uh, they, uh, and not until Eyes on the Prize in 1987 are they really disseminated for everyone. Um, but for African Americans, these photographs are so important. So many people talk about them later, how these are the, these, this photograph of Emmett Till, uh, the story becomes a motive for their, for their joining the movement. Uh, John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, Lewis, talks about it, and Moody talks about it, Muhammad Ali talks about it. The Till story was really formative for them. And that, and that story and those photographs are passed down from parents to their children. It becomes, as, 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 one's person, as, as, as one person put it to me, it becomes part of the talk okay. that all black parents give their children. And the Till just becomes part of that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go on and just quickly say there is a trial of the two brothers. There were others involved, we know mm -hmm. that now. But there was a trial of the two brothers very, very quickly, a few weeks after the body is found. And this trial becomes sensational news, not just in America, but around the world. Uh, it becomes sensational news around the world because this is a classic Cold War story in an era of decolonization. What is America like for its people of color? Um, with, of course, the, our Cold War enemy, the Soviet Union, talking about how, well, this is how America treats its, uh, its, 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 its non-white citizens. And the USIA, this nice thick file in Washington from the United States Information Agency, doing its best to spin this story. Trial lasts a week. In the end, even though and there's a couple of surprising things about the trial, the prosecutor is very, very good and really wants a conviction. It's not that he's against segregation. It's not that he's against the old Jim Crow system that still thrives in the South. It's that he does believe in the rule of law. And, and he, everyone, all of the African-American journalists at the trial, and there are many of them, uh, say that he did a great job. The judge mm -hmm. is very fair. The judge refuses to race bait, refuses to allow any of that. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is that there is a middle-aged jury of all white men, uh, and they all say after the trial is over, they would not convict a uh, fellow white man of killing a black. They're clear that that's that that's what what will happen. Yeah, yeah. I um, 
And I, I definitely want to to pick up this thread again, but I want to go back to something um, that you mentioned, and it really kind of leads me into my first question too. Um, you established really early on, especially in the intro, um, you know, you, you give the reader a lot of threads, you know, like, um, you know, talking about memory. Yeah. Um, what you pointed out earlier is that um, this was very much a part of conversations in African-American families almost immediately, but it would be another 30 years before, you know, the pictures and, and things like that were actually outside of the African-American community, if you will. And so um, and you also all acknowledge in the intro that the story has been told many times. So is is it the the idea of memory that's that's a thread throughout the entire story um or or something else um like are wh what are the things that really led you to believe that you should retell this story well uh, a, a few things um one of the interesting things about this story um and, I, and i'm asked the question you just asked me a number of times there is an assumption that this story has been well told many times it's been told more and more, but it really is a story that's come back to us. Um, yes, Eyes on the Prize. Mm -hmm. There had been, when I started writing uh, this book, and I started writing it, started working on it in 2010, there actually was only one real academic book about the Emmett Till story. There were very, very, there's very, very little that was book length, serious, telling this story. It's really come back to us so powerfully in recent years, 1987, as I say, Eyes on the Prize, but then slowly a few other videos, uh, um, uh, uh, Keith Bochamp, who does his, his uh, video of, of Emmett Till, um, African-American video companies uh, uh, do, do the story, and it only slowly really comes back, so that suddenly it's as if we, we as, as journalists sometimes say, it's as if we've always known the story, when in fact, white people haven't always known this story. They knew it in 1955, and they pretty much forgot about it. If you go back to uh, newspapers and look at the 10-year anniversary, the 25-year anniversary, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing at all. Uh, it's, not, it's not there. It's only in, in, in quite recent years that it's become just a, just, just the, again, another way of thinking about it is that in the era of Black Lives Matter, even before beginning with Trayvon Martin, do uh, you see the stories about these killings, these murders, and so many of them begin with Emmett Till, and that's a very new phenomenon. That only okay. started in, fair, in, in a few years ago. Another way to sort of measure that is if you go back to mainstream press, Time Magazine, the New York Times, and look in search engines for Emmett Till, you find um, that of course there were a lot of stories in 1955 going into 1956 and then that more or less disappears uh very very few and then only in the last really even less than 10 years suddenly stories again and again and again references to emmett till so mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of interesting thing there okay well i, I want to get back to Trayvon Martin in just a minute, um, but you kind of opened uh, the door. You gave me the perfect segue to my next question when you mentioned the media. Um, and something that you wrote um, really st um, stuck out to me um, as, as, as a member of the media. Um, you wrote that the Daily News helped to make Mississippi the most reactionary state in the South. And we talk a lot about the role of the media, especially in this country. There's a lot of mention of like fake news. And I think that's one of the reasons why this, um, this phrase right here stuck out to me. Um, so I'm wondering if you can explain more fully the role of papers like the Daily News, because they, they weren't alone, um, but the role of papers like the Daily News and the impact particularly on criminal trials and investigations. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say that Mississippi didn't earn that reputation. Uh, it's, it certainly did. And, and, and the, the Till trial is a, the perfect example of it, of, of um, just sort of digging in people's heels, people digging in their heels, uh, uh, just an, uh, an unwillingness to acknowledge that anything terrible that happened here, other than a couple of guys maybe got drunk and murdered someone. Uh, it's not a lynching so far as the 
Southern press, especially the Mississippi press, is concerned. It's just, you know, it's just it's just an unfortunate thing that happened, and justice will prevail. That was the the general the general tone. Um, but also something more than that, a tremendous defensiveness, uh, uh, just just especially in the Mississippi press, um, but uh, but more generally in, in, in the Deep South and the, even in the border states, a sense of grievance that's so strong victimization that comes through, that we are being picked on, that this, the North is just as bad as the South, that uh, and, and, and on and on and on. Murders like this happen all the time. Um, that's, and, and, and there is a truth in that, that there is a kind of way that Northern media, newspapers, whatever, um, deflect uh, 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 blame, criticism from themselves by, well, no, Racial problems, white supremacy is a southern problem, uh, and, and 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 Lord knows that again, if Mississippi is going to be stereotyped, the state did an awfully good job of, of of helping of assisting. So, in a lot of ways, I guess really, especially and this is something we do a lot on backstory. I know you do as a historian as well when we're, we're looking at patterns from the past, in a lot of ways, we've just traded North-South for liberal and conservative. Would you I agree even, with that? I'm not even sure we've traded North-South uh, for, yeah. li for liberal. Well, we, we, we do liberal and conservative a lot, but I, I know an awful lot of people who, who say they will not go to Mississippi, they will not go to Alabama, they will mm -hmm. not set foot in those states, either out of righteousness or fear it's unclear sometimes exactly what but no we we, we do stigmatize the south and the north and and yes uh, yeah, I, if i understand what you're saying yeah we stigmatize them as um uh too backward too right reactionary too conservative uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing people people do that there's no doubt about it uh uh i i say that as someone who's lived in alabama so uh, mm -hmm. in the past yeah so I want to I want to spend a little bit more time in this area, at least you know, um, adjacent to it. Um, you you spent a lot of time, um, uh, like you devoted a, a chapter pretty much to the dynamic between law enforcement, the media, social justice me uh, leaders. Um, in in it, you said that. Um, Simeon Booker, who was one of the uh, African American reporters, described that as an interracial manhunt. And for me, this was fascinating to see play out. Um, how did the research for that chapter come together? Like, what types of things did you use as your source material, and and how? How did you make decisions on how to reconstruct it for the reader so that they would really kind of understand what Mr. Booker meant by an interracial manhunt? Um, really, for that for that uh, section, the the best sources and, and in some ways the main sources there's not there's not a huge amount of that does come from the African American journalists themselves describing what they did which was to, when, when it became apparent that there were witnesses that had not yet come forth, and this trial is going on, they got themselves into position to go find those people and bring them back, bring them, let them, allow them to come to Sumner, Mississippi and to become, to become witnesses. Um, so literally, uh, uh, the best source is probably Simeon Booker's own memoir, uh, mm -hmm. des describing that. Um, and, and he's a very interesting source too because this, here's a man who was a mature journalist, a very you know very good distinguished journalist. Would never he'd never been deep south to the deep south before, a few months before the Dill trial. So this was all very very new to him too. Uh, James Hicks also Jimmy Hicks as he went by his byline, um, another uh, another journalist who described all this in considerable detail. Now there are others also who were involved. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, 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 I'm blocking your name right now. Um, oh God, I can't believe this. Um, um, Maggie Rivers, though, for one, was involved. Right. Uh, Amzi Moore apparently was involved also. They they don't leave a lot of records of this, but but they're involved in going out. There were a few white um, uh, uh, sheriffs who were involved too, who made their their vehicles available to go out and, and get people. Again, they don't write about it. They don't say much about it, but we know that we know they were there. 
So it's this, it's this very interesting thing. I, this, this is a good example of one of those things in telling the story that I have pretty good sources. I wish I had a lot more. Um, so. Okay. And do you think, and, and I think this is probably a good time to return to part of what you were pointing out um, with Trayvon Martin, because that, that seems to be um, a good parallel or, or even Black Lives Matter. Um, so how, how do you think at least then it was perceived and, and what parallels can you, can you draw to today? And, and again, in thinking about like the press and this dynamic that formed between law enforcement and what that might look like for us today. Um, you know, if, if in a certain way, um, the parallels are not perfect by any means. The, the, the failure of law enforcement for Emmett Till is not the constabulary, the police, the, uh, uh, the failure is the court system. Mm -hmm. However, however, in, within the court trial, there is the sheriff of Tallahatchie County who basically becomes a witness for the defense rather than the prosecution, which is his job after all to, to help get, uh, get convictions. He becomes really, um, and, and through some pretty awful stuff that he's willing to say on the witness stand, uh, he's the, he, he becomes a key part of getting the defendants off. Um, but, but I, I think, I think the most important parallel, even if the details change, um, is a failure of criminal justice, a failure to to seek justice, get justice, and to, and to to make people feel as though there is a there is equality before the law. Whether it's a cop shooting, whether it's in the courtroom itself, uh, it just seems it's a, it's a failure of justice. It also matters. Trayvon Martin is the first one where really suddenly the comparison is made where, where Trayvon, very shortly after Trayvon Martin died, um, on the web, a, a meme went up. It was a photoshopped image of Trayvon Martin arm in arm with Emmett Till. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the parallel is made uh, uh, in people's minds that this is the same kind of unjust killing with no repercussions uh, for, the, for those who did the, the murders. Um, of a young man uh, who, who's palpably, clearly innocent. Um, and this, this happens repeatedly. That, that kind of image shows up again and again in, in the last several years. So, so right there, there's the, uh, there's the parallel that, never mind whether I'm drawing it or not, others are drawing it, are, 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 are making the, uh, the, the comparison. And, yeah. it, and in many ways, it is a fair comparison. Yeah, I, I have to say, just on a personal experience, um, I have two sons who were teenagers at the time of Trayvon Martin. Now, they're now both in their early 20s, but um, that's the first time I talked to them about Emmett Till oh, wow. um, because uh, based on that, and they were seeing that and they were like, mom, who's Emmett Till? You know, so um, yeah, I, I think I think the, the at least the parallels between the two how how they ended up losing their lives um, were very similar. And ha as that information started to surface, I think that for a lot of African-American families, I, I know at least for mine, that's really when we had the Emmett Tell conversation again. I, I didn't have this conversation with my kids like generations before yeah. me had. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. I think the other thing that parallel that's, that's so pernicious um, and, and, and that, and that People know in their guts is is the assumption uh, that 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 uh, that's made that young black men are dangerous uh, and therefore fair game uh, uh, and it's just it, it's 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 just there it's hard not to imagine that it's not by accident but that when Emmett Till is killed it's in the midst of the the South being still in that uproar over Brown versus the Board of Education mm -hmm. that would put young black men in proximity to white girls. And that's that sort of thing said over and over and over again, um, that that's, that's a piece of this, young black men are dangerous. And, that, and that's, it, it's, it's not the, um, you know, as a historian, I'm supposed to, um, you know, draw distinctions and say, well, no, it's not exactly the same, and this is, and it's true, there are real, very major differences.
but that's a really fundamental parallel. Uh, and, and, and that piece of racism, of white supremacy, um, is still very much alive. Mm -hmm. Well, this seems like a, a good time to really talk a little bit more about the trial because you, you said a few moments ago that the, the failing, at least, of the, of the system was, for at least in this case, it was the trial. And so um, my first question about that in, 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 in relationship to where you're talking about black boys are dangerous, one of the, the stereotypes that was invoked a lot was about black sexual predators. Um, and and you, you talk a, a lot about like sex from the very beginning, um, but that, you know, just the idea of a boy becoming a man, um, at least for these purposes, um, that, that was something that was frequently invoked. Um, what role do you feel like the Till case played in, in cementing these notions? Oh, I, I think these notions are so much older than, you know, uh, than Emmett Till. I mean, um, that's, that's probably the most common single charge that, that leads to the to lynchings, to the, to the 5,000 lynchings, uh, mostly in the South, mostly of black men, uh, um, uh, that, that the, the violation of, of uh, the sexual code, of, of sexual honor, as, as, as it's called sometimes. Um, uh, so Emmett Till is Emmett Till. The reaction to the story, the Emmett Till story, is 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 it, it, this this is this is a story that's played out a hundred times, a thousand times. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the trouble is in this case. Well, he's from Chicago. He's not from Mississippi. He's just turned fourteen years old. Uh, he's not a particularly big kid. He's five foot four. He's always described as roly poly. Mm -hmm. Although, although in 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 again in memory, he's often uh, by those who would you know who would try to make make the case that it was a reasonable thing, it was a reasonable possibility that uh, that he was a sexual predator. He's usually thought of as bigger, older, uh, and so on. He's a kid. He goes into yeah. the store to buy some bubble gum, you know. Um, uh, so 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 so, but 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 that is that is just threaded throughout the story. It's 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 it is. And it doesn't even have to be said all that often or all that much. Everyone knows the codes. Everyone knows what's at stake. Um, so, so, but it's there. It's there from the from the beginning. So, really, it, it's just, I guess, maybe cementing is the wrong word. Like you said, these these things have always been around. It's just, I guess, I guess maybe for some. Um, especially for those who are, are far enough removed from those codes of being considered the norm, I, I guess maybe it feels like a little, a little jarring um, in some ways. Yeah, I mean, things do change and, 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 and that, that assumption, that deep, deep assumption, that's what Brown was all about. I mean, it was not just about kids going to school Together. It wasn't a terrible, for Southerners, Southern side was a terrible assault on their way of life. Jim Crow segregation, white Southerners saw that. But a little bit underneath the surface, uh, and not very far underneath the surface, it was not just kids going to school together, and this is one institution among many that could be integrated. It was black males and white females, uh, intimacy that was, that was really deeply feared. Um, and you're right. Um, we've we certainly haven't gotten completely away from it, but it does seem a little less prominent now. Today, we feel it, and and, and sort of has to be explained to people a little bit, uh, a little bit more today. That's that's certainly that's certainly true. Certainly true. Yeah. Do you think um, that the trial was? Um, I think you alluded to this a little bit, you know, when you talked about the judge was fair, mm -hmm. the, the sheriff was like largely fair. Uh, not the sheriff, the, the or not, I'm sorry. prosecuting attorney. The prosecutor, yeah. yeah. Um, that, um, do you think that was like groundbreaking in some ways? Do you think there were, aside from that, um, do you think the trial at large was, was groundbreaking? Um, uh, just in in general, um, like as far as 
the overall impact, the, the cultural impact, its its overall place within the civil rights movement, especially now that we reflect on it. Um, is there anything else that just kind of really stands out for you? Oh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, worth there, noting. There, there are there there are many things. Um, um, uh, first of all, the journalists there, there it was extremely well covered. There were something like seventy five journalists there, mm -hmm. something like ten or a dozen African American uh, uh, journalists. Uh, and some well-known ones, Murray Kempton um, uh, from the New York Post, who's a very well-known journalist. Mm -hmm. David Halverson was still young, but a, a truly a rising star. James Kilgallen, who had been, was really considered one of the most prominent um, uh, scribes of, of crime. Uh, he had covered the Lindbergh, the Lindbergh kidnapping back in the late 20s, so and he, he was well-known. Mm -hmm. um, so, so newspapers send some, some very, very prominent uh, journalists. Um, and, and they covered the trial, they covered the trial very well. That's part of it is that you have this great coverage. One of the things for me as an author is there also, the trial transcript had disappeared for 50 years and only reappeared early in the uh, 21st century. It's online, www.fbi.gov, and, and you, can, you can find it there. Um, and that, that allowed me to really tell the story in some depth, to hear not just voices that we might not otherwise hear, but hear voices talking to other people, talking to each other. So Moses Wright, who testifies about the men who kidnapped his son, famously stands and points. Do you recognize J.W. Milam? Points, there he is. Do you recognize Roy Bryant? There he is. We hear Moses Wright uh, and Till's uncle testifying. We hear him being Maybe badgered is too strong a word, but certainly uh, uh, um, the the defense attorneys were certainly pretty pretty tough on him. We hear Mamie Till Bradley. She was Mamie Till Bradley back then. We hear their voices. That's an important part of it. The trial was spectacular. It was covered headline news all over all over America, and in some ways that might be because um, well, just well, it was spectacular because there probably hadn't been a trial as famous uh, and as uh, probably even it was maybe it was not as well covered in the national press, the Scottsboro Boys back in the thirties. Um, so so it was, it was very, it was, it was very, it was important. People paid attention. Uh, what do you think um, the role of um, rumors and hearsay played in, in the case? And also in the court of public opinion during this this period, it was very important. Um, uh, just for example, um, well, one rumor that, that started after because because one of the things the main defense by the defense attorneys was that the body that was taken out of the river was not in the till; mm -hmm. it was someone else. Maybe it was a plant. Maybe they implied the NAACP had planted it to stir up trouble between blacks and whites in this community that was very harmonious. That's literally what they what they said. Uh, that, that that northern organizations would come down and plant, as one of the attorneys said, a stinking corpse uh, to to do this. So so there that that because there, after the trial, it becomes a rumor. For example, that Emmett Till is still alive and he's been spotted here, there, the other place in the north and the south. Um, but that's the central um, theme, that idea. It's not Till. It's someone else who they took out of the river. The body was way too far gone. That body had to be in the river for days and days and days and days. Um, all of these things, that, that becomes part of, the, part of the story, too. It's the, it's the indispensable fig leaf for the defense. It's the indispensable way to let the jury say that there is a reasonable doubt that that's who this body is. Was. Even though his mother identified him, even though he was wearing his father's ring when they took his body out of the uh, out of the uh, uh, river, even though there was an eyewitness of those who uh, they he, he he saw the um, he didn't see the murder, he didn't see the beating, but he heard it and he, and he witnessed it. He described it, even though the 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 killers admitted the kidnapping itself. Didn't matter. Didn't matter if there was a good judge. Didn't matter if there was a good prosecutor. It was not. That was the, the, that that 
that jury was certainly going to make sure that there was not a conviction. Yeah. Hey, you spent a, a good portion of the book, you know, just, it, it, you can see that having the, the transcripts in, in a way was like such a treasure to the, to the telling of this. And, and you spent a lot of time um, talking about the trial and it, clearly it, it, you know, like you, you said, there's a lot of significant moments. There's a lot of reasons why this this trial stood out yeah. um, for reasons. Um, but let's let's move forward a little bit and talk about like after the trial. Um, one of the first chapters um, I recall um, that was like, you know, after. I don't want to say we've moved on because for African Americans it was very clear yeah. that th we weren't moving on. Yeah. And so um I'm interested in um one of the things that struck me is a description you had of Mamie Till Br uh, Bradley after the trial and what I was thinking about is that to me there was a very clear evolution uh, that you're seeing from when you first introduce her and, you know, you're talking about where she comes from, her failed marriages, those types of things, especially to that moment for me. So I'm curious for you, what do you think was the public perception of Mamie Till Bradley, especially before and after the trial? And what were your own personal observations and going through the research and reading the transcripts and all of these things, what did you see as her evolution and, and how would you describe it? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and um, uh, um, you know, no one, no one is equipped to deal with what she dealt with. Uh, mm -hmm. It just, it's impossible to even, to even conceive. Um, uh, but she, the, the evolution really is the right word. And, and um, it, it's, I, I, you know, I, I think somehow she understood, probably not even consciously at first, um, how this story, what had happened to her son, um, it would change her for the rest of her life, not just in the sense that any terrible loss like that is going to change us. If mm -hmm. it does, it will, of course it will. But somehow, um, and, and there, there's, there's kind of a, this happens to women in history occasionally, uh, some terrible loss uh, that becomes, um, that, be, that somehow gets transformed into uh, action, into the need to change the world, to, to redeem it somehow. Um, I, it was not very conscious of my mind when I was writing this, when I was writing the book, but I, I had been here before in another book I had written about Mother Jones, the labor organizer, uh, who had lost her whole family in a yellow fever epidemic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and years after, years after, she becomes Mother Jones. And they both have the same, there's a parallel that's really interesting. Mother Jones becomes, she thinks of herself as the mother of the labor movement. And, and workers think of her that way. Um, and Mamie Till Bradley, says she much so much as says i lost a child but now i have thousands of children the sense of responsibility that she had that that she had to make what happened to her son happened to her too had to somehow make something of that make the world better fight racism uh make it make it very conscious it's it's a remarkable transformation i i wouldn't begin to say i could really get inside of her head it's, it's you know, just can see it happening, almost literally see it from photographs of her before crowds of people, uh, yeah. enormous rallies. Um, she was very popular and, and for organizing the Emmett Till story becomes a, a first, first initially for several months after the murder, uh, it becomes very important. And then it, then it sort of finally takes its place with the, you know, with, with other, many other stories. But yeah, it's, it's a transformation that's remarkable. How she, the idea when she decides before, when her son gets back to Chicago and she makes the decision, she sees his body, how, what had that, that horrible night must have been for him and makes that decision, let, let the people see what they did to my boy. 
She wasn't the first person to do that. There had been a murder in Belzoni, Mississippi, just a few months before an old man who had been registering, trying to register people to vote, who was shot and, and, and murdered. And his wife did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, uh, George Lee was his name. And, and it was covered in, by the Defender, for example. But it didn't, it was nothing near the story. It's the funeral was down in Mississippi. So, so there was a, this was just a few months before her and with Till's murder. So there was an example in, but in, in, her, in front of her, but that she decided to do it was remarkable. I mean, it's been pointed out, for example, in all of the terrible school shootings that we've had in the last few years, um, no parent has had the opportunity or been willing to do that. And because it's, how can you do that? You know, it would be so hard as a parent, it's unimaginable. And yet she knew that this was a sacrifice she had to make. Mm -hmm. she's quite, she was quite remarkable. Uh, yeah. And this was for the rest of her life. This was this was her life. Yeah, I was I was struck by this not only in the book but um, the uh, the new uh, Museum of African American History in Washington D.C. has an exhibit um, that includes the coffin. And I remember, you know, standing there, especially as a parent, because I, I, you know, and again, in the book, I was like struck by how this changed this woman and, and really being able to admire her in a way, um, because I, I knew she made decisions I, I wouldn't have made. Like, I'm, I'm almost certain I wouldn't have done any of that. Um, and so, um, but there was an admiration and I remember standing there and looking at the coffin and it's just like, you, you can see not only the love that she has for her son, you can also see she's thinking about other people are gonna see this. And so she is making these decisions. And um, I just I just had just such a, a deep respect for her because like you said, she did things that the average parent is not gonna do and understood the significance, especially, yeah. You know, as an African American woman in 1955, it, it was almost like if I don't do it, then who else will? Um, right. So yeah, I have a definite admiration for that. Um, you know, while we're talking about the significance of in, uh, individuals, um, what do you think the significance uh, of um, you know Emmett Till and you know in his mother? Um, what what would you say was their significance to the NAACP um, and and also as as a part of the civil rights movement? Um, yeah, it, it's uh, um, there's a kind of uh, difficult relationship between uh, Mamie Till Bradley and Roy Wilkins, who's the new secretary of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. um, she at first goes out as a speaker for the NAACP and. I mean, you have to remember what that organization is and their mission. Very, uh, you know, uh, the Legal Defense Fund, Thurgood Marshall, bringing cases, uh, uh, very, very policy oriented, and trying to get anti lynching legislation, trying to get, you know, new civil rights legislation. Um, and there's the, the rallies that Mamie Till Bradley is at, and others, many others. Uh, and these are thousands of people. I mean, there are photographs of them. Rally. She was an at this one in the Garment Center in New York, where the pictures of the crowd are astonishing. I mean, the size of these Emmett Till rallies. But there's an emotionalism to them that you get the sense that Roy Wilkins and the NAACP are not entirely comfortable with. That yes, they understand the importance of organizing, but they're very they're very oriented toward policy and so on. So there's a tension that's there in the civil rights movement that continues that has been there before and goes on for many years. And, and there's a there's uh, there's sometimes working together and sometimes not working so well together, uh, given those given those um, sorts of things. And yet the Till story becomes so important um, to the future uh, of the movement, um, even as even as whites are inclined to just sort of put it put it on the back burner. One of the uh, activists in the movement, Joyce Lardner, refers to what she calls the Emmett Till generation. Uh, mm -hmm. Those who are about, who come of age about, they're roughly Emmett Till's age, and they're going to be, be hit young adulthood around 1960 or so. And they remember that story was really powerful for them. As I mentioned, John Lewis, it's, 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 it, when you read his memoir, it reads like this is sort of, this is a moment where, just a galvanizing moment 
for him uh, and, and, and many others. Uh, Rosa Parks says uh, at one point she's asked, uh, what were you thinking about when you, and this is someone who was, who was an activist. She was, a, she was a secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery. Um, but she says, I was thinking about Emmett Till. She had been to a speech a night or two before. She, uh, she famously would not give up her seat and it was about Emmett Till and that's what, that was on her mind. So, so the story really continues. It really, it really has an impact. Yeah, yeah. I want to, um, I want to be mindful of our time because it's a j little bit after seven, um, and I want to see if we have any questions from our audience. But while I'm taking a look, um, there's something I want to pull at a little bit um, that you said earlier when talking about. I guess the trial specifically in the South, um, you said it was important. I think at the time we were talking about the, the press too, it, it was important to them for them to say it's not a lynching. And you devoted chapter five to that, like the differences between labeling Till's death a murder or a lynching. Um, and I'm wondering if, you found yourself having inner conversations about those two words as you were writing too, because it's, sometimes it's it's talked about as a murder, and then other times we return to phrasing it as a lynching. Um, so did you did you have conversations like did you have moments where you like maybe paused and say should I write murder or lynching, um, and 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 can you share what that dialogue was like and and how that that chapter, how did that change your writing? Um, I don't know if it changed my writing. Uh, maybe it did. Um, you know, my first, my first inclination is, well, you know, lynching, we have this idea of what a lynching is. You know, it's, it's, it's got to have a crowd of people around. It's got to have photographs. It's got to have, you know, and, and, and there is until the 1930s or so, this kind of classic pattern of vigilante justice uh, where, again, you look at the photos, the most appalling things about lynching photos, and there were so many of them, these were like souvenirs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, you look at the faces in the crowd, the white faces, and there's no sense of guilt or shame. There's no sense that anything's wrong. On the contrary, these people see themselves as helping to establish justice. And there are, in many of the lynchings, dozens, hundreds, even thousands of people. Um, this is different because it's it's vigilante justice, but it's you know at first in the trial it's only two people. We know now there were it's hard to know an exact number who were involved in exactly what they did, but six, eight, something like that. Um, so so in that sense, well, is this really a lynching? Well, of course it is. Tuskegee Institute had a long-standing definition that was perfectly reasonable. It was an extrajudicial, an extrajudicial killing. Uh, needed three or more people involved, um, and and it's not part of their definition, but generally they're racially motivated, right? And that's a perfectly good definition. Uh, um, is it just and then the distinction in the press, especially between a lynching and a murder, uh, for the southern press especially? Well, a murder just means yeah, a couple guys drank too much, a couple guys got out of control. You know, this is within the normal parameters of justice. There's nothing wrong racially here. There's no larger racial story to tell. Um, it's denying, just denying uh, uh, the, what, what is so obvious. And, and, and this story is, is about nothing but race. Um, uh, a, a, a white Emmett Till isn't kidnapped and murdered. It's that simple. Um, so, so, of course, it's a lynching. Uh, and by any by any reasonable definition, without without the public ceremony part of it, true. But lynching is a, is a is I think the proper word. Um, so did it change? You know, I use both words. I use them almost interchangeably. I hate repeating myself. Uh, you know, I hate saying murder twice in you know two lines. Um, but no, I have no doubt that lynching is the right, the right word. And, and 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 I guess if you're asking, did did writing through that issue as I read did that convince me? That's a good question. That's a good question, and I think I think the answer is um, yes. I don't think I had thought it through before I had to really write it uh, fully. Thought thought it through, and and and, and became convinced that yeah, it's, it's the right word. Okay, thank you.
So um, I always like to end my interviews um, by kind of like just asking, is there something I didn't cover? Is there a question that you wished I'd asked and you haven't had an opportunity to answer or if there was just something you think it's really important for our audience and, and people who read the book to know? Um, no, yes, yes, very, yes, very good questions. Um, you know, I, I guess what I'd say, I'd say, I'd say a few things. Um, um, I do think this is an important story to keep alive and keep telling. I really do. I think this is this is a very fundamental American story, um, not just in terms of what happened in 1955, but how we've remembered it over the years. Uh, I try to spend a fair amount of time thinking about and writing about how the Emmett Till story gets remembered and changed with time. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say is. Um, I think one of the things that's important about this story, it, it becomes a kind of um, an American, and this, I, I understand that the parallels are not exact, they certainly aren't exact, but Emmett Till has become really, in recent years, I think, a kind of American Anne Frank, that we, we only understand the horror of historical events when they're personal in some way, that, as was said, the, the, the death of one is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. Here we see a face, we see a face before and after, we see just, just the horror of it. Um, it I, 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 think it's, I think it's a story to confront. I, I, think, I think maybe Till Bradley's, what she said, let the people see, is just really at the key, at the, at the, uh, the center of this. Okay. Well, I think that is the perfect way to end this live stream. So um, I want to thank you again for your time. I'm going to show your book really quickly. Yep. It's Let the People See, the story of Emmett Till, and it is by uh, today's guest and our uh, February author selection, Elliot Gorn. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching this uh, episode of Book Story. Bye-bye.